Okay, so I have to do this this formal introduction. I don't know why I'm doing this, but I kind of feel like I need to do it. I don't know why. Ah, okay, so welcome to a, another lecture for Introduction to Computer Graphics. <laughs> uh, so if you will remember, last time we talked about the rendering equation. And today we're going to continue uh, that topic. Today we're going to talk about rendering algorithms. Now, this is not going to be just, you know, take the rendering equation and come up with an algorithm to solve that equation. It's not going to be like that. Actually, you will find that the discussion of rendering algorithms is going to be very unrelated, almost completely unrelated to the rendering equation that we talked about. Uh, we're going to tie them later on, much later on. Um, but the rendering algorithms, when we talk about rendering algorithms, we're talking about something much simpler than what the rendering equation uh, talks about. The rendering equation talked about shading, right? Light comes to a surface and bounces off. Rendering algorithms are going to be dealing with uh, more fundamental things. Um, so what do I mean by that? Well, here's, here's what I mean. What we want to do with a rendering algorithm is that we want to generate a raster image, right? Let's say we're going to display it on, on a monitor like this. Right, and the image we're going to generate will be something like some some background, some object, some hopefully some three D object. We're, we're going to generate this this image, this raster image of whatever we want, right? But um, the part that the rendering algorithms are mostly concerned about, at least they're concerned about first, is figuring out what parts of these object of of this object corresponds to which pixel on this raster image. That's the part that, that needs to be solved first, right? So figuring out where my object is on this raster image and which triangle of this, this, this model corresponds to which pixel, right? That's the, that's the main problem that needs to be solved uh, by the rendering algorithm. And then once we have that, and if you have the, the information about the surface, we know how to do shading, right? Once we, once we know what triangle corresponds to which pixel, once we know that, we, we, already, we already implemented shading, we, we know how to do this, we, we can do the rest, right? So the rendering algorithms will be concerned about the, the phase right before that at first. All right, so um, talking about the popular rendering algorithms uh, out there today, uh, we can classify them into two main groups. We can uh, think about rasterization and ray tracing, right? And in the context of rasterization, uh, I'm going to talk about a, a number of algorithms. There, there will be the, the painter's algorithm, the Z buffer rasterization, and A buffer, and the Reyes algorithm uh, that I'm going to talk about. And the other group is formed by ray tracing. Well, you can think of different sort of rendering algorithms in the context of ray tracing as well, but they're a little more closely tied together. I've listed here ray casting, path tracing. You can list a bit more. But the, most of the ray tracing related algorithms are more about solving the rendering equation itself than just solving the basic problem. The basic problem is solved by this ray casting component. The rest is more concerned about the, the rendering equation and how to solve the, the realistic shading and realistic illumination problems, right? There are a whole bunch of algorithms that are based on ray tracing. So I'm just gonna talk about ray tracing as, as one thing and I'm gonna go over these, these other rendering algorithms in the context of rasterization. All right, and I find this, this this sort of discussion very, very helpful, actually. I, I, I think it's important to understand rasterization well so that we can understand ray tracing. And we need to understand ray tracing well. And we kind of need to understand rasterization well as well. So the, this, this whole thing is actually, the, this whole topic, I think, is a very, very fundamental, important topic. But this this um, lecture is going to be relatively light. So um, not much math. It's more about general concepts. So just sit back and relax and try to try to pay attention. <laughs> okay. So let's start talking about about rasterization first, right? So what is rasterization? We've done rasterization actually. We we even implemented rasterization, although the rasterization was done for us by the GPU, right? So it at broad strokes, what rasterization does is that it takes 
some vector definition of our scene in the canonical view volume and it converts it to a raster image. So in this simple example, I'm showing a one triangle in the canonical view volume. We know how to get there, right? We've done all these transformations. We take good uh, triangles in object space, transform them in all the way into view space, and then the canonical view volume. After that, the rasterization takes over, and then it rasterizes that scene definition or triangles or primitives into a raster image, very much like this. Now, this is looking okay. It's a little low resolution image, right? <laughs> it doesn't look all that great. It kind of barely looks like a triangle. Um, so if you don't have that many pixels, of course, this is not gonna look great. You need a lot more pixels if you wanna have like a nicer looking triangle edges here. But we could still, even with this many pixels, we could do a better job, right? that we could do what we call anti-aliasing, uh, in which case we wouldn't have just um, red and white pixels here. We would have sort of in-between color values as well. And this looks a bit more like a triangle with a softer edge. The softness is, of course, is a function of how big our uh, pixels are, right? So we're going to talk about the concept of anti-aliasing, uh, but basically you can think of this as um, coloring these, these pixels based on what percentage of each pixel is covered by the triangle. So if I were to draw the triangle over here, uh, you will see that triangle perfectly covers, completely covers some pixels here, and it partially covers the other pixels. And if you can um, adjust the color of these pixels based on how much of that pixel is covered by the triangle, you would get pretty good anti-aliasing. Um, and so that, that's the concept of anti-aliasing. It actually uh, comes from signal processing, the, this whole term uh, anti-aliasing. But you can think of this as doing a better approximation of what percentage of a pixel is covered by our objects. It's a, it's a, it's a good way of thinking about anti-aliasing in the context of computer graphics. All right, so in the end, you know, we get a nice looking anti-aliased image like this. We can do that with, with rasterization. Now, the biggest, one of the biggest problems that rasterization based renders will be dealing with is what we call visibility. That, that is, if I have more than one triangle here, if I just don't have just one triangle, but if I have maybe another triangle, if that triangle now, now I can figure out, is this triangle in front of the other one or behind the other one, right? Figuring that out is going to be one of the important difficulties that rasterization-based renders will, will be dealing with. Like, is, in this case, the blue triangle is in front, or maybe the red triangle is in the front, like which one is in front, and what should I do based on which one is in front of if, which, which triangle, right? So, this is the general concept of rasterization. Now, let's... Um, talk about some specific algorithms using the, this concept of rasterization. The first one that I'm going to talk about is what is called the painter's algorithm. So what's, what could a painter's algorithm be? What do you imagine when I tell you painter's algorithm? Let's, uh, let's go through that. Let's say that you know, I have this, this canvas and I want to paint, right? So um, I'm some, put, putting some paint over it. Uh, right, I started with something like this, and then I'm adding this piece on top, and then I'm adding some more, and maybe I'm adding some landscapes, and then another landscape. And do, you, do you see what's happening here? Do you see the pattern? There's actually a pattern here. Like, what I did is I started from the back, from all the way back, and I started moving, uh, uh, painting things that are closer and closer and closer to the view, to the camera, to the hood. I, I don't know if it makes sense to, to call that camera, but whatever, we're, we're painting, uh, and we're just painting closer and closer parts um, over the, the parts that are at the back, right? So that's the idea, so from, we're painting from back to front. And another piece that is closer, see yeah, another piece that is closer, another portion that is closer, you that? And another portion that is closer, and one more that's closer, and one more that's closer. So what comes next? Can you guess what comes next? Well, at least one of you did. Very good. Yes. Of course. Bob Ross. 
Who else? Uh, if you don't know who Bob Ross is, check it out. I'm not going to tell you. But don't do it now. We're talking about rendering algorithms, okay? Don't get distracted. But but do check it out later, all right? <laughs> okay. Moving on. So um, we have our scene defined as a, with some 3D primitives, and we're looking through this monitor, and we're, we want to form an image, we're going to generate an image on this monitor screen, right, a raster image. And we're going to do that using Painter's algorithm. So the way the Painter's algorithm is going to work is, as you might have guessed, is that it's going to start by sorting our triangles from back to front, because we're going to draw them in that order, right? So after I've uh, completed the sorting, then I can just draw the, the triangle at the very back, and on top of that, I can draw the, the next triangle and the next triangle and so forth. And uh, this whole problem of visibility, that which triangle is in front of which triangle, is sort of solved by the sorting operation that I've, I've, I've done in the very beginning. And it's all good. This works out just fine. Except that it's not as easy as you think to sort the triangles. Well, of course, there's some computational cost to it. Yeah, there's some computational cost to sorting. Uh, but beyond that, it's not it really well defined sometimes because I could have a geometry like this. My triangles could be sort of overlapping. And even if they're not going through each other, they could still be overlapping in, in, in terms of how far they are from the camera. So it's not always easy to tell which triangle is in front of which other triangle, right? And in that case, this painter, painter's algorithm is going to struggle, right? So if it picks one triangle, I'm going to get this image. If it orders the other way, then I'm going to get this image. But I am not going to get this, right? It's not capable of producing what I'm supposed to see here. Uh, it's just going to pick one triangle or the other because I'm, I'm drawing them in order with painter's algorithm. So it's, it's not giving me a solution to that problem. Right. So, I mean, you can think that, oh, you should you really shouldn't have triangles that are overlapping with each other, right? I mean, maybe, maybe, maybe that's a sort of weird edge case. It really shouldn't happen. It doesn't happen, or does it? Can you think of, can you think of a model where it has, Triangles that are overlapping with each other? <laughs> yes, one of you did. That's right. Utah Teapot actually has triangles that do overlap with each other. Right? So if I were to render Utah Teapot using Painter's algorithm, I'm probably not going to get the correct triangles for each pixel here. Right? So that's going to be a little bit of a problem. Uh, so that's the, that's the thing with the painter's algorithm, just to, to reiterate. It will need sorting, and it will not be able to handle intersecting geometry. That's, that's a severe limitation for the painter's algorithm. Right? So there isn't much we can do about that, except that we can replace it with a slightly, or maybe significantly better, ra uh, rasterization-based rendering algorithm, that is the Z-buffer rasterization. Now, this is probably the most popular rendering algorithm on Earth. The most frequently used rendering algorithm on Earth. Uh, way more images are generated using this algorithm, way more images by orders of magnitude using this algorithm than anything else on Earth because <laughs> all of our GPUs use this algorithm. Right? All of our GPUs are designed to, to run rasterization. And where you know, you're looking at your computer monitors, everything you see on the screen is drawn using Z-buffer rasterization. Right? Even, if, even your 2D windows and everything, they're drawn using <laughs> Z-buffer rasterization. So yeah, it's kind of hard to compete with the number of images that produce every second on Earth using the Z-buffer rasterization. So this is what we use on the GPUs. Not just, you know, these uh, you know, beefy GPUs on your desktops or, or um, on your laptops. Um, also, like on your mobile iPhones, everything that you see that, that, that has some graphical interface to it, 
it will be handling the rendering operations using Z-buffer rasterization, right? So this is an important algorithm, and this is actually the algorithm that you have used for implementing our previous projects. We've actually used Z-buffer rasterization because we use the GPU rendering pipeline. Remember, we had the, the, the vertex shader that passed uh, its data to the rasterizer. Yeah, that rasterizer does Z-buffer rasterization, all right? Uh, and then using Z buffer rasterization, we get our image, and that's what we've been we've been doing. So uh, let's let's find out about Z buffer rasterization, right? So this is the concept of rasterization. Um, what we're doing with Z buffer rasterization is that we are adding a, what we call a depth buffer. That is, for each pixel here, each for each one of my pixels, I'm going to have the RGB or RGB A color value, A being the alpha value. You may or may not have it, but it doesn't matter, it's there. I have an RGB A color value. Also, I'm going to store the depth value. The depth value for each pixel will tell me how far this triangle that corresponds to this pixel is from my view, from the camera. How far it is from the camera. That's where what it's going to store. And it's going to store that for a particular point, of course. It can't store, it will not be storing a range. It's going to be storing that depth value for a particular point that is going to be the, that, that is going to be the center of each pixel. Right? So at the center of each one of the, each pixel here, I'm going to have a depth value. Now we call that depth value Z value. And why is that? I mean, it should be sort of obvious to you all, I think, because on image space, this is X and this is Y, so Z is going to be towards you, right? X, Y, Z. So negative Z is the direction that we're, we're looking at uh, when we look at an image like this. So um, all of the Z values will be negative. <laughs> so the, the Z buffer, is the buffer that stores all of these depth values or, or z values. And using those z values, we can determine which triangle is in front of which other triangle. For example, if I have a, another triangle like this, another blue triangle, I can draw that triangle on top of, uh, on this raster image, and by comparing the z values, I can determine which triangle is in front of which one, right? And so if this red triangle is in front of the blue triangle, then this blue triangle will only get these other pixels that are not covered by the red triangle, right? So that's what Z-buffer rasterization will be able to do. And, and to be able to do that, I don't need to sort the, my triangles at all. I can render them in any order that I want. And this, this Z-buffer will figure out, will help me figure out which triangle uh, is actually in front for that point and uh, on and at the center of each pixel. Uh, and of course, with this, it's perfectly okay for my triangles to be overlapping. It's perfectly fine because I'm going to do this comparison for each pixel and for the center of each pixel. So I'm going to do this comparison of which triangle is in front separately, independently for each pixel. So which triangles in front can be different for each pixel. So for some, some pixels here, the blue triangle is in front. For some pixels, the red triangle is in front, and that's perfectly fine. So Z-buffer rasterization can definitely handle the, this um, significant difficulty of uh, the painter's, painter's algorithm. It will not have any problems with differentiating which triangle is in front. So all that triangle is perfectly fine. So, um, you know, there are, there, there, you know, there, there are some nice things about this algorithm. There are some not so great things about this algorithm as well. Just a side note. Uh, one of the things that happen is that based on the order in which you draw these triangles, for some of these pixels that I had um, overlapping triangles, uh, I needed to shade these, these pixels multiple times, right? I, if I'm drawing the red triangle first, I'm going to shade the red triangle. And then I'm drawing the blue triangle, so I'm sort of going to paint over it. So it's very much like the painter's algorithm in, in that concept. 
but I don't need to pre-sort anything, so I can do, do the, the sorting on the fly using the Z-buffer. That's the, the advantage of the uh, Z-buffer rasterization. So um, I can also do anti-aliasing here, right? So I can actually figure out what percentage of my pixels are covered with which triangle. So in this case, you know, um, this is not the um, hand-drawn perfect anti-aliasing. And it should look like something like that. It is possible to do this, although it is quite a bit difficult. There are some difficulties associated with that. But the the, the simplest thing you can do to get an anti-aliased image like this with Z-buffer rasterization, the simplest thing you can do is to have multiple samples per pixel. It's a very, very simple idea, very, very widely used idea. So this is called super sample anti-aliasing. In this case, in, in this particular case that I'm showing here, I have four samples per pixel. So I could be using four or, or, or more. I could be using any number basically, but our GPUs that uh, implement Z-buffer rasterization will only support a few values. Uh, I, I believe they support four, eight, 16. Um, I don't know if they go beyond 16, I, I don't believe so. But anyhow, it doesn't really matter. Your GPU may or may not support all of these nodes, but this is um, a, a typical thing to do, super sample anti-aliasing. So this is very much like actually rendering a much higher resolution image and then sort of downsampling it to a smaller image. And in this case, I am storing four color plus depth values per pixel because I'm using 4x super sample anti-aliasing. If I use 8x or 16x, I'm going to be using that much more per pixel. Right? So this is kind of expensive, as you can imagine, because this, uh, uh, what we call frame buffer, that contains the, the depth values and the color values, it's going, to be, it's going to take up a lot of storage. So that makes the whole rendering process a lot more expensive. Also, I am going to be doing a lot more shading operations here, right? Each one of these samples per pixel, I'm gonna to have to shade them. So in this case, I am doing four times the shading operations as I would do otherwise to compute the colors of these pixels. Like if I had only one sample without any anti-aliasing, I would only shade each pixel once. Okay, some pixels will get shaded multiple times because I have overlapping triangles. But beyond that, each triangle will invoke one shading operation per pixel at most, right? But when I have multiple samples per pixel, I'm going to be shading those, those pixels multiple times. But I can get very, very good anti-aliasing. Uh, people thought about, like, I'm going to talk about super sample anti-aliasing. I must also mention multi-sample anti-aliasing. That's a funny name, actually. Uh, MSAA, that's a multi-sample anti-aliasing. It's a, it's, a, it's a mix between not doing anti-aliasing and doing super sample anti-aliasing. The thing is what we're trying to figure out with multi-sample anti-aliasing is we're saying that we can compute the color values just fine using just one sample, one sample per pixel, but the depth needs to be sampled more densely. So I can figure out which triangle is in front of which one more accurately. So with multi-sample anti-aliasing, our GPUs will store multiple depth samples, multiple Z values per pixel, but um, a collection of Z values will be associated with one fragment, and that one fragment will be shaded only once. And I'm going to store a single color value that will be associated with more of these pixel samples. So, Multi-sample anti-aliasing is significantly cheaper because of that, because I don't have to store a separate color value per sub-pixel sample. So these are, are sub-pixel samples, right? All right, moving back, forget about anti-aliasing for, for, for a second. And one of the reasons why anti-aliasing becomes a little difficult to do, and we kind of need to do this super sampling or multi-sampling kind of things, is, is that with Z-buffer rasterization, what is really difficult is handling transparency. So if I have opaque triangles like this, it's fine. It works just okay. But if I have a 
a sort of semi-transparent triangle, like in this case, things get a bit more difficult. Now, in this case, z-buffer rasterization, pure z-buffer rasterization, will require sort of ordering of my triangles. So if I order my triangles from back to front, I'm going to be fine. So if I just draw the, the blue triangle first, in this case because the blue triangle is at the back, and then I draw the red triangle on top, I can generate this image using alpha blending without any problems. We've all done alpha blending, you know the concept. So we can do alpha blending here and, and we're going to be okay, right? So every time I have a new fragment coming in, I just blend it with the previous fragment and I'm going to be fine. So I can actually produce this image, not a problem, none whatsoever. But, but if I render this, if I render these triangles in the reverse order, if I render this semi-transparent red triangle first, and then I try to render the blue triangle, then I'm going to be in trouble. Because when I try to, when I look at the, the pixels over here that, that where the blue and red triangles overlap, the depth values will store the depth values of my red triangle. So Z buffer rasterization will say, hey, the blue triangle, you're, you're behind. So I'm not gonna draw you, right? You're behind the data that already exists on this pixel. So you're gone, you're thrown away. So I'm not getting the correct image now, right? Because uh, the, the semi-transparent, supposedly semi-transparent red triangle is completely covering the, the blue triangle in, for some pixels. Right, so I am not getting this image that, that I should get. All right, so that is a problem with the z-buffer rasterization that you kind of figure out different ways of, of, of dealing with. So with to summarize, with z-buffer rasterization, it can handle uh, intersecting geometry just fine. We, we're not having any problems that the painter's algorithm was suffering from, but it is having uh, trouble figuring out which triangle is visible. We call that the visibility problem. Uh, it's having some trouble with visibility when it comes to semi-transparent primitive, semi-transparent triangles. Right. So it needs sorting for transparency. Uh, in that case, just like in the painter's algorithm, if you just sort your semi-transparent primitive, semi-transparent triangles, and you draw them from back to front, you're going to be OK. But it will require that, that sorting. So there are methods out there that work on GPU. You might have heard some of them that do uh, what we call order-independent transparency. They sort of get around z-buffer rasterization, and they they don't actually do z-buffer rasterization because that's the only way to to get around this. So what they do is sort of closer to another rasterization-based rendering algorithm, that is the a-buffer rasterization. Uh, A-buffer rasterization is very closely related to Z-buffer rasterization, but the important thing here is that it can handle order-independent transparency. But it will require more and uh, more memory and sort of dynamic memory allocation. That, that, that's the cost of that. So A-buffer rasterization is an algorithm that is used for uh, offline software rendering a lot. Because you can get very high quality images with A-buffer rasterization it can give you super high quality anti-aliasing, and it can do that very cheaply, but it had this extra cost of sort of handling dynamic uh, frame buffer memory. And the way it works is actually very, very similar to, to Z-Buffer, except that for each one of my pixels here, I'm not just storing one color plus depth value, but I'm going to be storing depth plus color value and also the coverage, like what percent, what part of the pixel that my primitive is covering. And I'm going to be storing a, a linked list of uh, different fragments that correspond to that pixel. For, for each pixel, I'm going to have a linked list of fragments. And I'm going to be storing this linked list until the rendering is done. And that's the reason why it requires a lot more and a lot more memory and a lot more dynamic memory. Uh, while you're rendering, because it needs to maintain this this linked list, and because it because it maintains this linked list, uh, 
now I can draw things in an in, in arbitrary order. Let's say that I have I have two fragments for, for this particular pixel here. Actually, I'm not showing the back fragment. I can have as many fragments as I want. It doesn't matter. So basically, I, I have this, I have something here uh, for that pixel, and I'm drawing my next triangle that's sort of behind the red triangle, right? And with, with this order, with a buffer rasterization, I can easily, you know, put the data related to my new triangle in between here, right? So I, I'm not losing any information, and I can get perfect anti-aliasing, and it, it works just, just beautifully without any problems, without creating any artifacts. And I do not need to do any kind of super sampling or even multi-sampling, right? But I need to sort of manage this dynamic memory. And actually this sort of thing happens a lot. You may think that, oh, it only happens when I have two triangles that overlap. It actually does happen when you're using anti-aliasing and you have two triangles that are next to each other, like along the edge, I am going to get multiple triangles corresponding to the same pixel. And you kind of need to handle those cases really well. And they happen a lot all over the place when you're rendering. So this is not a rarity. It's not rare that you're going to have multiple fragments per pixel. You're going to have a lot of those when you're rendering, especially if you're rendering high quality scenes with lots and lots of triangles with very, very small triangles. This sort of thing can be very, very expensive. And, and that's why it's, it's used for offline rendering, not for GPU rendering, right? Although, you know, there are variants of this idea that is implemented on the GPU to give some sort of, some, some limited form of order independent transparency uh, on the GPU today. So it's possible to implement parts of this with modern GPUs, although if you're sort of disabling the Z buffer component of your GPU rasterization and you're sort of replacing it with some software handled A buffer like algorithm. Right. So not supported by GPUs, at least natively, although yeah, you can you can do a lot of things in software on the GPU. <laughs> Alright, so this was A buffer. Another very, very popular rendering algorithm is called Reyes. So that is red, red, short for renders everything you ever saw. Yeah, so this is, a, a, this is actually a very, very old image from 1980s, rendered in the Pixar studios back then, and rendered using the, the Reyes rendering algorithm. And the, the idea is actually quite similar. It's still rasterization, right? Well, with Reyes, what it does is that, so back in the day, in the 80s, people were using all sorts of different data structures for representing 3D models. So we were not, we were not all using polygonal meshes everywhere. Uh, people were using other types of objects as well, for example, the uh, you know, Bezier patches, for example, or nerve surfaces. They were a lot more popular than, than they are today. Uh, so the idea there is that you take a surface defined in whatever thing you like, and then you dice it out into smaller and smaller and smaller pieces. Smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller pieces, all the way down to something like something very small that is smaller than a pixel. And that those are called micropolygons. So with Reyes algorithm, you would take a primitive and you, you dice it all the way down to these small, super small micropolygons. And then you can you can figure out the visibility of micropolygons. So you you uh, work with subpixel uh, level operations to figure out the visibility, right? So it's the, still the same idea. The the important part of that is this this aggressive uh, subdivision. So instead of taking a giant triangle and figuring out all of the pixels that it, it intersects with. Ray's algorithm will just take that primitive and dice it up all the way down to very, very tiny primitives and then try to figure out where those are relative to each other, right? It's still the same idea, but the algorithm-wise, it's very different. As you can guess, this is actually quite expensive, but it allows you to add things like displacement mapping, for example. So you can take each one of these micro polygons and you, you, you can move them based on some texture space value. So your primitives don't have to be flat primitives or even simple curved primitives. They can, they can have some really complex shapes. And, uh, so this, this allows you to relatively easily define very complex geometry. 
And in the end, yes, this is an expensive rendering algorithm. It's not suitable for rendering on the GPU. So it's not implemented on the GPUs today. But it is used for rendering. Even today, actually, it is used for rendering. Here, here are some more recent images rendered using RenderMan. RenderMan is Pixar's rendering software that they use for rendering their movies. And uh, RenderMan is uh, the Reyes renderer. Uh, there are other Reyes renderers out there as well, but RenderMan is uh, is the one that sort of started this 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 whole idea. And it's all data structure and everything is defined around this concept of Reyes rendering. Right. So it's a very very popular, very very popular rendering algorithm even used today. But today it's often used in conjunction in conjunction with ray tracing. Because ray tracing will allow us to do a lot more than just figuring out what triangle corresponds to what pixel of the screen. It will allow us to do a lot more than that. That's what makes ray tracing really, really valuable. So the Random Man was one of the, the last renders to sort of adopt ray tracing because it doesn't really fit well with ray's sort of rendering. But eventually they did, and uh, so they're, they're, they're using it as well. Uh, so. Let's talk about ray tracing. <laughs> I'm going to use that as a segue to talk about ray tracing because I said we need ray tracing. So let's let's see what this thing is and why this is important. All right now, I like to talk about ray tracing in the context of rasterization. I find it quite helpful. So I'm going to start with comparing rasterization and ray tracing. All right. So rasterization is what we've been talking about, and if you think about the algorithm of rasterization for any of these algorithms that we talked about. It sort of looks like a, a for loop like this, right? So we start with the primitives, and, and there's a for loop going through all of our primitives. And for each primitive, I am figuring out which pixels of my uh, raster image that primitive corresponds to. So different rasterization-based algorithms handle that somewhat differently, but nonetheless, they all they all do something like this, right? They all have a something like a for loop that goes over all of the triangles and it will figure out where the pixels are that correspond to each one of these triangles. Ray tracing will do the opposite. So it sort of flips the, 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 the random process and it starts with pixel samples. It starts with the pixels. For each pixel sample, ray tracing will find the closest primitive. So it's it, you can actually think of this as like the almost like the inverse way of doing rendering. The, the inverse operation that actually does the same thing. So I don't want to call it the inverse of rasterization. It's not quite true because they're still producing a raster image. They are producing the same output, but they're 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 doing this operation. So ray tracing does the backwards operation of what rasterization does. Rasterization starts with the vector image. And from the vector image, it's going to the pixels. Ray tracing starts with the pixel samples. And from pixel samples, it tries to figure out which primitives each pixel sample will correspond to. All right. So I'm going to show you this slide that we, we, we looked at earlier when we were talking about transformations. With rasterization, I have perspective transformation here. I have the camera set up over here. With rasterization, we know what it does. I'm going to take each triangle and I'm going to figure out where it falls on the raster image and I'm going to draw it on the image and then I'm going to take the next triangle and I'm going to draw the next triangle. So with, with whatever rasterization algorithm we use, this is the, the procedure that we follow. With, with ray tracing, we're going to start with, we're going to start with all of the triangles at once, the, the entire scene, right? Actually, we don't even need to define this perspective projection volume. We don't even need to have this, this linear perspective at all. So I'm going to just throw that away. It, it, it doesn't matter. What's important is what's important is where my screen is, where my pixels are in 3D space. So this is my pixel sample. And if I know the position of my pixel sample in this, this camera space, I can generate a ray from where my camera is into that pixel, all right? So the next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to follow this ray and I'm going to trace this ray and figure out where this ray would intersect with my first primitive. 
In this case, it intersected with the red triangle. So I found the closest point. That's closest point in the scene that I will be seeing through this pixel sample. And then I can do my shading operation and figure out what the color is. And I put that color for that sample and I'm pretty much done. And one of the beauties of, of this sort of rendering is that handling semi-transparent objects becomes quite trivial, actually. So if my triangle, red triangle, is not opaque, and so it's sort of semi-transparent and I'm, I'm sort of seeing through it, then all I got to do is that I can just continue tracing that ray. Right? I can continue tracing that ray and I find the next intersection. And then I shade the next intersection and I, I can do the, the auto blending with, with this pixel over here. Just to be clear, we typically do auto blending from back to front, but you don't have to. You can do auto blending from front to back as well. As long as you know the order, as long as you, you do either front to back or back to front, but you can't mix and match, but you can't get the, the fragments in random order and do, try to do auto blending. But you can do alpha blending from front to back or from back to front. Either way is fine. And uh, with, with ray tracing, we can easily do it from front to back. And you know, we can continue until the, the pixel is completely covered and there's no see-through object. Right? So that's the idea of, of ray tracing. And to form the image, what I'm going to need to do is that I'm going to have to do the same thing for all of my pixel samples. Uh, that form my raster image. And, you know, I don't have to use one sample per pixel. If I want to get nice anti-aliasing, I can have multiple samples per pixel, just like the Z-buffer rasterization. I can have multiple samples per pixel. I can have just one sample per pixel. It doesn't matter. For each one of my pixel samples, I'm going to be doing the same operation. I'm going to be sending a ray through them and figure out where the ray will intersect with my object, and I shade them, and eventually, I'm going to get my final image like this. So as you can see, it can handle the semi-transparency very nicely as well. So it all works out and everything is great. But, 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 this is not what makes ray tracing super important. Yeah, it can handle transparency. And yes, it is definitely an advantage. But it actually gives us things that are much more important than doing this, much more important just, just doing this. One of the biggest advantages of ray tracing is that it, can, it allow us to do very realistic shading because we will be able to use the same concept, the same mechanism to do very realistic shading operations. And this is not something that rasterization-based renders provide, but ray tracing-based renders give us this ability to use the same idea, just sending rays to the scene and figure out where things are. We will use the same idea to do all sorts of interesting operations to, to get realistic shading, and that's how we produce realistic looking images. And that's why ray tracing is the standard for offline high quality rendering in computer graphics. So any of the you know, super realistic lifelike images that you see, I can guarantee you that they're rendered using ray tracing. It's very, very hard to get things looking realistic using rasterization-based renders. With ray tracing, there are all sorts of algorithms that use the concept of ray tracing to get realistic images. Let me give you an example. So just a very simple example. Here's my scene. In my scene, I have a teapot and a flat plane underneath. All right. So I'm doing ray tracing. I'm rendering with ray tracing. So here's one of my pixel samples. I'm going to generate a ray that goes through that pixel sample. Now I'm going to call this ray a primary ray. So we call this, this ray a primary ray because it's generated from the camera. So all rays generated from the camera that go through uh, pixel samples, we're going to call them primary rays, right? And I trace this primary ray, and this primary ray is going to hit something in my scene. Let's say that it's hitting this plane over here. Now, at that point, at that point, when I'm doing shading, I can generate another ray. Now, for example, I can generate a ray like this. Now, this will be what we call a secondary ray 
We call it secondary. There's no tertiary or anything. We only have primary and secondary rays. Secondary rays are all rays that are generated while doing shading. Okay? Any kind of ray that we generate that is not generated from the camera, we call it a secondary ray. Uh, and in this case, I'm using the secondary ray to do reflections, to figure out reflections. So, for example, if this plane was a mirror-like object, mirror-like material, then I would see the, the reflections of my teapot, right, or whatever is whatever else is in the scene. So, I am going to be using the same mechanics of ray tracing to figure out the reflections that I will be seeing on, on this object. And for that, I'm generating a new ray with a reflected direction, and then I'm going to traverse that ray now, and I'm finding where it intersects, and I can shade that point. And, and this way, I can get very nice looking, proper reflections on my reflective surfaces. Right? So this is where the power of ray tracing is hidden. Because rasterization-based renders will not give us any sort of help to do things like this. Because a rasterization-based render will take a triangle at a time, and put it on the screen, and they're done with it. All right. Anything else you want to do, you're on your own. Your rasterization-based render will not help you at all. But the ray tracing-based render will allow you to generate rays and to do all sorts of different queries by generating secondary rays during shading. And that's where the power of ray tracing is hidden. And those secondary rays are used for all sorts of purposes. They can do for reflections and refractions. If there's a semi-transparent objects, rays can refract through refractive objects. And again, something that we can't really do with rasterization. Uh, they can handle shadows, very nice looking realistic shadows, even soft shadows we can get uh, with, with ray tracing. Realistic illumination, I'm talking about global illumination here. Is the, the, the idea that light bounces off in the scene. It's a very, very important concept for generating realistic images, actually. Very, very important concept. So we can get realistic illumination. So we can solve our rendering equation properly. All right, so ray tracing will give us the mechanism to solve our rendering equation. Numerically, though, but, but solve our rendering equation properly so we can get very realistic looking images, right? That's, where the power of ray tracing is. So going back and comparing rasterization and ray tracing again. So you can say, well, okay, but if ray tracing is so powerful, why, why are we using rasterization, z-buffer rasterization on all our GPUs, not ray tracing? Why, what's, what's the deal? Now you might have heard some GPUs today are sort of giving us some limited form of ray tracing, but they're, they're still designed for rasterization. They still do rasterization. They, the graphics API still works with rasterization, even though they have some ray tracing capabilities. I'll tell you more about that in a little bit. But they, they are designed for rasterization. The reason for that is rasterization is fast. Ray tracing is slow. <laughs> and here's why. Because for each primitive, find the pixel samples, that's a very fast operation. I, my pixel samples are on a grid. So give me a triangle, I can very easily, very, very efficiently tell you where the pixel samples are. But what's the operation inside here? It's saying, for each pixel sample, find the closest primitive in my entire scene definition. Find the closest primitive. Well, I can have millions of primitives. Tens of millions of primitives, maybe hundreds of millions of primitives in my scene. Right? Finding that one primitive that corresponds to that one pixel, that is inherently expensive. And I need to do that for each one of my pixel samples. Right? So that's why this part is, is a lot slower. But the nice thing with another nice thing with rasterization is not just the difference between the speed difference between these two operations, but also what's the most expensive thing with computers today? In today's computers, the most expensive operation is not just computation related stuff. The most expensive operation in today's computers is data movement, how you're accessing your data. And our data, we have, uh, we, 
we have large memories in our computers today, right? Our DRAMs are giant, especially in, in comparison to how big they were in the past. But, but DRAMs are designed to optimize data accesses that are contiguous. So if you're accessing your memory linearly, you get super high performance out of your DRAMs. But if you're accessing your memory randomly because I'm just doing some search operations, I kind of need to figure out where this thing is, this search operation, you'll find the closest primitive, is going to be accessing the memory sort of randomly. Randomly meaning um, in an unpredictable manner from the perspective of the memory system. And so the performance of, of our memory system is going to be sort of uh, being hindered as here as well. Also, for each sample, I'm doing this search, right? For each sample, I am doing this crazy random search. Uh, so instead of going through all of my scene once in just one contiguous block. So this the speed difference between these two, you know, this is fast, this is slow, yes, but when you compare how they access our scene data, the difference is really drastic. Like the uh, rasterization is much more efficient than, than ray tracing. When you factor in the, the fact that rasterization accesses the scene in a much more efficient way, at, at least for the computers we have today, right? But there's a limit to that. There is a limit to that. So with ray tracing, to be able to improve this search operation, that if I'm going to look at each and every primitive every time I have a ray, this is going to be ridiculously slow. It's going to be, we can't do any ray tracing if, if I'm going to look at each and every primitive every time I'm, I'm looking at a ray. So what we typically do with ray tracing is that we build some spatial data structures, spatial partitioning structures. So you can think of this as like a, a, a binary search tree, if you will. So we build some, some tree structures that accelerate this, this search operation, find the cl closest primitive. By accelerating this, this search operation, we, we, can, we can access our scene data. So we don't have to access all of our scene data, but then we kind of need to access our scene data randomly. This random access is mostly coming from the fact that we're using some tree structure to accelerate this, this search operation. But over here, there's no such thing. Like I'm linearly looking at my entire, entire scene, right? So if my scene is containing a lot of triangles, a lot of triangles, at some point, rationalization is going to start suffering because it has linear complexity in terms of the number of primitives I have in my scene, right? So it's linear complexity because I'm going to rasterize each one of my primitives one by one, right? It's just linearly going through all of my primitives. It has linear complexity. But theoretically speaking, ray tracing actually has sort of logarithmic complexity because of the, the search trees that we form to accelerate this find the closest primitive operation will give us logarithmic complexity in terms of the number of primitives in our scene, right? So as we render scenes with more and more complexity, really, really a lot of triangles, a lot of primitives, at some point, ray tracing is going to start catching up. People have been making this argument for a long time, but turns out you really need a lot of triangles. For, for this to be actually effective, all right? So for most practical applications, rasterization is still giving us faster rendering performance. Nonetheless, nonetheless though, as I mentioned earlier, with ray tracing, I can do a lot of things. A lot of things that help me generate realistic looking images. With rasterization, I have no such thing. This is just doing what the primary rays can do. And turns out, when you're doing rendering uh, and when you have these secondary rays to handle all sorts of reflections and whatnot, the cost of those secondary rays is a lot more expensive. So the, this 
extra cost of primary race for handling what rasterization could do using ray tracing is it becomes negligible. So um, ray tracing is pretty much the standard for offline high quality rendering today, partially because of that. So here are some examples. These examples, well, this, this one is generated using the Arnold renderer, uh, the, the background. I believe in this case uh, is rendered the rendered part. I mean, you, you know, you, you look at these images; they're rendered using a lot of rays per pixel, and in the end, you get something that is really, really difficult to differentiate from reality, right? So here's a another example again using the the Arnold renderer. It's it's well, it's not possible for me to look at this image and tell you, oh, like these things are rendered, and these things, these other things are obviously obviously captured by a camera, right? It's impossible to tell. I don't know if this is actually 100% 100% rendered or maybe there, there are things here that are captured in camera. There probably there are things in here that are captured in camera, but I don't know. This one, I believe, uh, this is rendered using V-Ray, another great render. This is also using ray tracing on V-Ray. <laughs> it's a ray trace based render. I, I believe this is 100% rendered image. Um, but maybe I'm wrong. Maybe there, there are a couple of photographs in there in the background. Maybe I don't know. But you know, the, the whole point is that you can get really super realistic looking images. And I'm showing you examples from two renderers here. There are a whole bunch of ray tracing based renderers because that is the standard for offline high quality rendering in computer graphics today. Right? But one of the things people do is that they combine rasterization and ray tracing. So I talked about Reyes and, and, and RenderMan. And I told you that RenderMan has now ray tracing support because you kind of need to have ray tracing support to be able to figure out a solution to the rendering equation. For all these secondary rays where rasterization is not going to help us at all, we will need ray tracing. Right? So this is a very typical concept. Actually, back in the day when ray tracing was too slow to, to handle when all of the renders were using some sort of rasterization, this sort of setup was actually quite common. So you would handle all of the primary visibility using rasterization. Some sort of rasterization could be Z buffer, could be A buffer, or rays. And then on top of that, you would add ray tracing support for handling secondary rays that gave you reflections, refractions, shadows, and, and realistic illumination. So all these secondary effects were handled using ray tracing. So this is a very, very common setup, actually. Even today it's used, but, but, for most cases, for when you're doing high quality rendering with a really expensive scene with lots and lots of triangles, these secondary rays here, this is where you spend most of your render time. Almost all of your render time is here. Right? Almost all of your render time is here. So there is no point in doing this <laughs> with rasterization if you're going to spend all of your render time in here. You might as well handle this part using ray tracing as well. Right? So that's one of the reasons why ray tracing is used for rendering everything in today's high quality offline rendering, rendering applications. Uh, so there's really no point in, in dealing with rasterization. Also, remember that rasterization has sort of different kind of complexity, different kind of bottlenecks. And when you're rendering really, really expensive scenes, this may actually be less efficient. And the way that it uses memory is also less efficient. Also, it requires linear projection. For example, you cannot do fisheye lenses with lenses with rasterization. I can, you can reproject the image and you know you can generate a raster image using rasterization and then mess with it to get some sort of a fisheye effect, but that's not what I'm talking about. You cannot render a, a fisheye lens image using rasterization. But with ray tracing, if you handle primary visibility using ray tracing, you can do anything you want. So it's a lot more powerful. And that's why high quality offline rendering is done using ray tracing. Now, I want to clarify one thing about ray tracing here. So this is the part where people can get confused about a little bit. So if you were previously confused, don't worry about it. Uh, it's quite normal. A lot of people get confused here. So you can implement ray tracing in software, or you can implement ray tracing in hardware. I mean, this is pretty much true for any algorithm, I guess. You can have, you can implement that algorithm by writing a software for it, or you can design a chip, a custom chip that does, that implements that algorithm for you. 
For example, our rasterization, Z buffer rasterization that exists on our GPUs, it's implemented in the hardware. Now, I ha we have physical hardware units that does the Z buffer rasterization for us. But you could you could do Z buffer rasterization in software as well. A lot of software renders that do, for example, A buffer, they handle rasterization in software. Same goes for ray tracing. You can then you can implement it in software, you can implement it in hardware. Now, our software can be designed to run on the CPU, which is quite typical, right? Typically, that's what we do. But I can also write software that runs on the GPU. So when I talk about ray tracing on the GPU, that might mean that I'm writing some software that runs on the GPU. Or it might mean that my, my GPU has specific so hardware support for ray tracing, in which case ray tracing runs on that specific physical hardware unit that sort of accelerates uh, ray tracing. So those are two different concepts. I just wanted to clarify this. For our upcoming project about ray tracing, we're going to do ray tracing on the GPU, but we're going to do it in the software. We're actually going to do ray tracing within a fragment shader. Uh, so it's going to be kind of a funny way of implementing ray tracing. I'll, I'll talk more about that later. It's going to be a very cool project. I'm actually quite excited about that. So this is what we're going to do. We're not going to be doing this GPU ray tracing using the hardware units that exist on some modern GPUs. We're not going to be doing that. That's a, that's a very different thing, right? And, and I, I can talk about that as well, but that's, that's, that's not what we will be doing. So that, is, that would be using physical hardware units that does the ray tracing for us, but instead we will actually be implementing ray tracing ourselves in software, but our software will be running on the GPU. <laughs> okay, so that's the distinction. Now I also put here in hardware GPU ray tracing, you might have heard ray tracing on the GPU is something that exists today. Now the thing is, the thing is, this is ray tracing support for GPUs, but the, the amount of ray tracing we can do on the GPU is somewhat limited. Again, GPUs are designed to do rasterization. They can do ray tracing, but this sort of ray tracing is more in line with to be to handle secondary effects. Right? So we expect to handle primary visibility using rasterization, and we want to add the secondary effects using ray tracing. We don't want to handle the primary visibility using ray tracing just yet because ray tracing is still expensive. It's still a little too expensive and we get better performance when we use it together with rasterization on the GPU. So that's what people prefer to do. Here, now, in, at the University of Utah and the hardware ray tracing group, we are working on a new type of GPUs that are designed for ray tracing and ray tracing only. So I'm a proud member of that group. We've been working on this, this project for quite a few years now. We have some really, really successful projects that have managed to achieve higher performance than existing GPUs. So I, yeah, I had to mention that, but it's, this is not a product that exists, right? This is, this is just uh, some, some, some research project where we're figuring out different ways of designing the GPUs, throw away all the rasterization related stuff that we don't need, and design a GPU around ray tracing only. Actually, our GPUs run C++ code. <laughs> uh, so that's one of the nice things about it. So just wanted to mention that because, you know, I've been working on that project for quite some time. And actually, people who previously worked on this project at the University of Utah went on to the, the industry and spearheaded the efforts in the industry that gave us the GPU ray tracing hardware we have today. So it's um, yet another graphics thing that sort of spun out of the University of Utah. Just have to mention that. All right, uh, so that's um, what I plan to talk about today. This is where I am going to, to end it. And all right, I'll end it here. Thank you all for joining and I'll see you all next time. So I'll see you then.